Welcome all. It's a pleasure to see all of you in person or by Zoom um, today for this conversation with the chairs and to celebrate our anniversaries at AEP. I've invited Christine McDonald, uh, soon to be graduate of our MFA program to read our land acknowledgement. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayakono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayakono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. Mm. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of the Gayakono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of the Gayakono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. This acknowledgement has been reviewed and approved by the traditional Gayakono leadership. Thank you, Christine. So it's our sesquicentennial for architecture and our centennial in art. And in just a few days, we'll be seeing our 150th class of architecture students and our 100th class of art students graduate. And throughout this very big birthday year, um, we've had the opportunity to look back in order to look forward. James Baldwin once shared, history is not the past, it is the present. We carry our history with us. We are our history. Today, our three chairs, Paul Ramirez Jonas, Caroline O'Donnell, and Sophie Oldfield, will share their insights into the future of the disciplines of architecture, art, and planning spanning disciplinary origin stories to the present and the future. My task is to set the stage for them and to share in 12 minutes the context of our own institutional history, our layered stories of students, faculty, founders, and facilitators across moments in time. As we acknowledged earlier, our story begins with the grounds we are on, indigenous lands dispossessed. And as you know, Cornell would become the largest beneficiary of the Morrill Act, signed into law in 1862 by Lincoln to fund and endow land-grant colleges through the sale of federally controlled, acquired, and taken lands. Cornell would become New York State's land-grant institution and in accordance with the Morrill Act, provide instruction in practical knowledge in agriculture, science, and engineering. But when Ezra Cornell and A.D. White founded the university, they did so without any buildings or a college of architecture. In fact, Andrew Dixon White, in his annual report to the trustees in 1867 wrote, buildings never yet made a great university. Better a splendid and complete faculty in a barn than an insufficient faculty in a palace. A few years later, however, in 1871, A.D. White would propose to donate his architectural library, the largest personal architecture collection at the time, to establish Cornell architecture. So the college began with a collection, a collection not of buildings, but of architectural books, photographs, and journals, and later a collection of splendid faculty, staff, students and practices. And while another school is cited as the first degree granting school of architecture in the United States, Cornell is cited as the first school to offer a curriculum in architecture, the course of study and the pedagogical practices of the discipline. Founded during Reconstruction following the Civil War, the country was both reckoning with its past and attempting to rebuild its future. When Cornell opened its doors, Jim Crow laws existed throughout many states and women were not yet allowed to vote. Students like Vertner Woodson Tandy, class of 1907, would leave a legacy both at Cornell and in the country. Tandy would not only help start the first black fraternity at Cornell, but he would go on to become the first black registered architect in the state of New York and build significant works that remain today on the National Historic Register in Harlem. 
and throughout his life, he fought for equity and justice, writing that we must fight till hell freezes over and then fight on the ice, advancing equality and democratic ideals through his lifetime. 20 years later, when Margaret Burke White, BFA 1927, set her camera on the edge of the 61st floor of the Chrysler building, she captured a vision of the metropolis, a vision of hope in social and technological progress with a single image. An artist and photographer, she would shoot the first cover of Life in 1936 and become the first woman staff member of Life magazine. A photojournalist during the war and a documentary photographer in the late 1950s, capturing on film the racial inequality and segregation in the South as the Supreme Court ruled on Brown v. Board of Education. She once shared that life is beating against the school windows. You must quickly open the doors and go out to learn that no door must be locked against you. Today, life is indeed again beating against our school windows, demanding that we engage in the positive change the world continues to need. Walter Benjamin once said that the idea of progress is grounded in the idea of catastrophe. When the Earth Art Exhibition opened at Cornell in 1969, one year after what Matthew Twombly refers to as the year that shattered America, 1968, the Vietnam War, civil rights, and the environmental movement exploded with force. The Earth Art Exhibition, exhibition featuring artists like Robert Smithson, Dennis Oppenheim, Richard Long, and Neil Jenny, and included student helpers, Gordon Matta Clark and Louise Lawler, who would themselves have far reaching and lasting resonance in the art world. Neil Jenny at the time shared, you could see art as being a social barometer of what's happening. Earth Art's refusal of conventional sites for viewing art, its acknowledgement of the earth and our relationship with it, its foregrounding of artistic practice as a process, able to break with traditions and shift our perspectives, a social barometer of what's happening in the world was resident, resonant then as it is now. And 50 years after the original Earth Art exhibition at Cornell, Tao DeFore's 2019 Preston Thomas Symposium reframed the exhibition and its relevance to the present day. During the period of the Earth Art exhibition at Cornell in the late 60s and early 70s, architects and computer scientists were breaking new ground in an entirely new way uh, with ways of seeing and computing. Our very own computer visualization pioneer, Don Greenberg, created one of the earliest computer-generated 3D perspective renderings here uh, of the Johnson Museum of Art, which landed on the cover of Scientific America in 1974. A visionary of computer graphics, Don with his students created the first computer-aided animations meant to simulate the built environment and its contributions to computing, design, and visualization have continued through today, where the search of a problem has become, in a way, a whole field of inquiry. It would be hard to conclude our timeline without inclu including the well-known figures of Colin Rowe and O.M. Ungers. Colin famously referred to architecture as a continuous dialectic between fact and implication. Arriving at Cornell in the early 60s by way of Austin, Texas, he created the first urban design studio shortly after arriving at Cornell and taught iterations of the course for the next 44 years. Collage City was a thought experiment and using Rowe's own words from the text, an examination of the city as theater of prophecy and theater of memory, of order and disorder, the state and the individual, the rational and the relative, and the archetype and the accident. His work attracted many minds at the time, and O.M. Ungers came to Cornell at Rowe's invitation and served as chair of architecture from 1969 to 75. 
a leading thinker, architect, and educator who's, who advanced structural and contextual approaches to design. However, Rowe and Ungers quite famously did not get along. While both were invested in the project of the city, Ungers shared in fact that their positions had absolutely nothing in common, quote unquote. Yet despite their conflicts, there was a mutual understanding of the urgency to develop a theory and practice of urbanism and develop a discourse on architecture and the city. Collage City for Roe and Cities Within the City for Ungers became their speculative manifestos, driven by the anxieties of the time for a new vision of collectivity and the future. Maybe I'll close our history on the roof of Rand Hall in 1952, when Buckminster Fuller and his architecture students designed and constructed Fuller's Geoscope, a 21-foot geodesic dome. Shoji Sado, BARC 1954, continued to work with Fuller after Cornell on various design projects. In 1969, Buckminster Fuller proposed a great logistics game as an interactive anticipatory design tool that played out how to overcome energy scarcity and territorial politics through the redistribution of the world's resources. His goal was to usher in a new era of resource consciousness, and I quote, to make the world work for 100% of humanity through spontaneous cooperation and without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. This radical, ra radical optimism resonates to this day and with our college mission to bring critical inquiry, design and imagination to bear on the greatest challenges of our time to build a more just, sustainable, resilient, thriving and inspired world for 100% of humanity. While I have not done justice, I'm sure, to 150 years of architecture and 100 years of art at Cornell in 12 minutes, what I've tried to do is paint a picture of our college then and now as the intellectual home and research hub, a think tank and a do tank for the future of culture, society, and the built environment, for the future of cities and our communities. And as we've oscillated between our past and present and traversed an incomplete history, I think what is clear is that as a set of disciplines in this college, we share a mode of knowledge at this very special intersection between the creative and the critical, working in imaginaries and realities to advance a better world. As such, our canvas can literally be the linen over a wooden frame or pixels on a screen or the layered complexities and forces that produce and shape our cities, neighborhoods and interactions. And now, just as in moments in our past, our disciplines have never felt more urgency to imagine, plan and build the future. As shared by science fiction writer William Gibson, the future is already here, just unevenly distributed. So in order to peer into the future, we need only to look deeply into the present. And often that future is tucked away in our studios, labs, and classrooms. Here at AAP, we not only have insights into the future, but an important role and responsibility for prototyping that future and taking action across our priorities in creative critical practices, sustainability and social impact, cities and communities, and design and emerging technologies, both here and in the world, bearing the responsibilities of the past in the present as we shape the future. I'd like now to turn things over to our chairs who will share their reflections on the future of their disciplines and insights into where we are and where we're going. Paul? Hi, everyone. Um, well, 
If we're going to talk about the future, we better establish a baseline for the past. And archaeologists have discovered in Indonesia a pristine 45,000 year old cave painting of a pig. And it may be the oldest artwork in the world. And that is the time frame that we need to consider when we are going to talk about the future of art. The past of art was collaboration. And us being social animals, art was embedded in communities. This is how the Adena culture or the Fort Ancient people, we're not sure which ones, built the Serpent Mound in the land of the Shawnee in Adams County, Ohio, around 900 years ago. This historical earthwork is nearly a quarter of a mile long and represents a giant snake maybe holding an egg in its jaws, and it's a result of many hands working together. But even as modernity was beginning to come about, art was still a collaboration. You can see it in this print titled The Invention of Oil Painting from around 600 common era, 1600. The Enlightenment, although it was an experiment in radical individualism, was not yet that. The future of that past was the triumph of the single author, individualism, along with a culture that emphasized each individual's potential for creativity and singularity, and also rights. Think of Jackson Pollock, photographed here by Hans Namath in 1950. This radical belief in the individual was not all bad. This belief is the basis for human rights, uh, direct democracy, one man, one vote, but also the Western canon. And this is Condition Report from 1998 by Glenn Ligon. So it's not surprising that when Olaf Browner directed the department then at the time called a freehand drawing at Cornell, he set out, and I quote, to develop the individuality of the students along rational lines, of course. Here we see Olaf painting in a self-portrait exactly 100 years ago today. And that's why it's our anniversary today. Our college's mission is in part to address the greatest challenges of our time. And these challenges are the unintended consequence of the Enlightenment's belief in radical individualism. This focus on individuality also created consumerism, lack of community, and by now, a seeming inability to work together on the big problems faced by humanity. The Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog by Caspar David Friedrich is at the summit, but he's there alone. So what are we to do? Wait a minute, Doc, are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? The back to the future of art is collaboration. But what does collaboration look like today? This is a collaboration between an artist and an architect, art faculty Maria Park and architecture faculty Brandon Hotway, who we sadly lost last year. The results use painting, sculptures, and drawings, and investigated social and control protocols using a diagrammatic language of flight cockpits and table settings. Our civic and cohort searches will bring additional faculty who are explicit about collaboration in their work. But we already have it. Students collaborate. Here's Uncle Boy's landscaping towards a quieter life an exhibition at Jaden Hall's Experimental Gallery between Irene Song and Curtis Ho, BFAs from 2020. And we will expand this as we think, teach, and create courses that articulate collaborations between artists, departments, even colleges, and with broader publics and communities. The past of art was also contextual. There are some of the, here are some of the reliefs of the lion hunt of Arshurupanipal from 2,657 years ago. The art is part of the wall. The art is the wall. In the beginning, art was inextricable from the built environment. Murals, frescoes, bas reliefs, statues, they all were integral to temples, homes, and palaces. The context could be a vital function like providing water, or it could be an instrument of worship or ritual, or decorating a site-specific place. Art meant something in relationship to a specific place or specific time or specific use. The Court of the Lions in Alhambra in Cordoba, Spain, commissioned by the Sultan Mohammed V of the Emirate of Granada in Al-Andalus, from 1362, produced meaning through its placement, its function, its imagery, and its aesthetics, all working together. The future of contextual art 
became autonomy. This is Vic Muniz's verso, anatomy lesson from 2016. It is an exact replica of the back of Van Gogh's Starry Night. The invention of the stretcher was one of the many steps art took, took towards being autonomous. Now on a stretcher, liberated from the wall, painting could be hung anywhere, be shipped anywhere. It could be stored. It could resurface years later. This and many other changes, some technical, some cultural, gradually tore art out of context and turned it into the autonomous work of art. And like all changes, some good and some bad came of it. Exchange and circulation allowed art to expand its reach and influence. It also gave artists independence. But at some point in this process, autonomy also became synonymous with the universality. But it was universality of one culture while excluding cultures and even other identities within the dominant culture. By the way, this is the Commuters from 2005 by Francis Alice. It's a painting hung in a museum at the opening of the day. The museum is unhung by a performer who takes it out for a walk and they come back at closing time and rehang it. The future of that past is to be contextual again. It is time to put the urinal back in the bathroom, my friend Tanya Bruguera said, and I think it was in 2009. I am sure it was on May 13th though. And she did just that when she installed the same model urinal Duchamp turned into the infamous fountain back into a museum bathroom. It regained a context, it regained a function. And just like Duchamp's original gesture, people ask of it, is it art? The recontextualization of art has been an ongoing process for a few decades now, and it can take many, many forms. You can see it in art faculty Lisa Mexen's piece, Turret Tops, from 2019 at the Cordova Museum and Sculpture Park in Lincoln, Mass. The pieces are not only integrated onto the site as they quote the Cordova Museum's iconic turrets, they're also embedded in the weather as they were designed to weather and change over an 11 month period. And we need to think of this even further, recontextualizing through other forms of knowledge and take advantage of our close proximity to architecture and planning. This is where a curriculum that emphasizes artists, scholars and scholar artists will continue to step up to this challenge. The past of art was also skilled. You can see it in Hishikawa's Moronubu's Weather, uh, Weaver and Dyer, a wood block from 1685. But the future of that past was de-skilling. After World War II, an entire generation of young artists in Japan wanted to reject anything having to do with the previous generation and the war. So they also rejected the passing down of certain traditional skills. This development was parallel to the descaling of Western art that began with Duchamp and accelerated and reached its end game with conceptual art in what we think of as the 60s. The artist was a thinker, not a maker, and learned skills got in the way of one's unique creativity, which was related to individualism. You can see this dynamic at play in Kasuo Shiraga's Challenging Mud from 1955. And the future of that past, past is reskilling. The future is reskilled, but not conservative. Representation and mimetism can and do come back, but through invented techniques mixed with traditional ones, like Tina Lam MFA from this year did for her sculpture last semester. Or when Sabrina Harte Gonzalez, graduating this year with a BFA, did when she made very technical molds to cast raw chicken skin. But the beauty and strength of art is that it is a cumulative discourse Nothing is ever thrown away. The future of art is always and, never or. So in the department, we will reintroduce collaboration without negating individual authorship. We will bring back the contextual aspects of art without denying the tradition of autonomy. Because like Marcel Duchamp said, art is a game between all people of all periods. And I wonder if it might be similar to something going on in architecture. Thanks, Paul. Let me uh, let me give that some thought. Um, so, my feeling is that while the first artists were painting the pigs on the walls of these caves, 
the first architects did not exist yet in that moment. And we can say that because um, in that moment, the cave itself was the shelter. The cave was performing by keeping the rain out, uh, keeping the temperature moderate, protecting us from praying animals. So we, we didn't need any of that shelter to be done by us. Uh, so the functional aspect of architecture was taken care of in that moment, and the meaning, the desire of the pig or the memory of the pig, the art, was taken care of in those drawings. So only as humans moved beyond the cave, beginning with the primitive huts, as the Bjork first years know very well, the first translations of the function of shelter into architecture came into being. Um, and that act of construction also brought with it the meaning, the desire or memory of the pig that had been part of the cave dwelling. Logia's primitive hut, of course, was a reminder of those origins of architecture, those primitive huts being born out of their relationship with nature and a call a long time later in 1753 to reconnect the elements of architecture with their natural origins. In this famous etching, the origins of architecture seem bound to their environments. It's beginning to provide shelter, not doing it very well yet, but beginning to provide shelter and structure and materiality, but it's also meaningfully communicating that continuity with nature. Anthropologist Tim Ingold in his essay, Earth, Sky, Wind and Weather, argues that there's no abstract planar surface on which to dwell. Instead, the rain softens the ground, the winds erode the land, the forests extend to the sky, so that to inhabit the land is not to be stranded on a closed surface, but to be immersed in the incessant movements of wind and weather in a zone wherein substances and medium are brought together in the construction of beings that, by way of their activity, participate in and uh, participate in stitching the textures of the land. So Ingold's diagrams, these are his diagrams, uh, not mine, uh, show the conditions of uh, what he considers the difference between living on and living in. Uh, but look, it's not the same stick figure in both of these diagrams. Uh, in the first one, the human is a neutral generic stick figure. But in the second, in the in, the human has acquired a few attributes. First, they have orientation. They've turned their back to the wind and they're facing the gentle Lee zone. Uh, second, the figure now has a, a stance or a gait uh, with which they are poised as if ready to act. And third, the figure has acquired hair, perhaps a material necessity of being in something. Nothing about diagram B, about the in diagram is fixed, but rather appears in a general state of interrelated action. So if we imagine, as architects maybe want to do, that the human is surrounded by an enclosure, and here I've added some, some lines, um, that enclosure in the top diagram might be a generic house. It does address the sky and the earth differently, but like its enclosed figure, it assumes a default form. Consider now a house in the land. That means a building that is operating ecologically, thinking about and acting on its interconnectedness. Presumably, it must also change its gait, orientation, and materiality. So this is one aspect of the future of architecture that I envision, that is, architecture in the future will be different because it will be in rather than on. And that means, firstly, the future of architecture is ecological. And ecology is a word that I choose carefully because it's a word about the interrelationship of things and their environments. That's all things and not only living things. We've started already in the Department of Architecture in our research labs and studios, in our books and projects to ask how we can change the way we deconstruct, the way we build, uh, the way we generate, use and save energy. Uh, we've begun to ask how we can affect the political and economic systems under which these strategies exist. We've already begun, but there's a long way to go, and we're planning projects that engage, and I mean really dig their teeth into these questions. Now, weather is something, uh, weather or climate is something that we as architects uh, struggle to represent, but we can and, and we do do it. Uh, and again, our first year BARC has been remarkable in this regard. Uh, but how does architecture change when we think not about in and on, but with? And so we could go back to Tim Engold and reimagine his quote, uh, and I have modified it here, so it's no longer a quote. 
uh, and say maybe to inhabit with is not then to be stranded alone, but to be immersed in the incessant movements of each other in a zone wherein people and cultures are brought together in the construction of beings that, by way of their activity, participate in stitching the textures of humanity. If we return to the paintings on the wall, the other common representation besides the animal um, is the other human, the collective or the group. So as we think about architecture existing in the world, we must think about it existing with the world, with our community, with each other, and with different others, uh, some of whose voices have not adequately been heard in the past. Uh, and so then if we think about the future, the future of the discipline and the department, um, the future is also social. We've already begun to ask, how do we engage, engage uh, underserved communities? How do we learn to listen, to communicate, and to represent differently? We have incredible faculty and students specializing in this area and the above area, and we must ask, how can we better understand the entanglements between the two, between the ecological and the social? Thirdly, uh, the future is technological. We also have incredible students and faculty who have already begun to ask questions like how are robots and VR and AR changing the way we live and the way we build? Uh, and in relation to the above, how are we uniquely positioned to engage with issues of technology while bringing the humanistic questions of the social and the cultural realms and the environmental realms to bear on issues of technology? And as an umbrella over all of these, uh, the future is built or constructed. Um, so the question is, how are the conversations we are having around the ecological, social, and technological transformative, not only to our thinking, our writing, our design, and research practices, but to the built world, the built world itself? Uh, how do we build differently when we think ecologically, socially, and technologically? Fully engaging with real communities, real developers, real estate, real materials, real construction details and so on is crucial to our ability to follow through and to make the change that we're currently enacting become concrete, although probably not concrete. And finally, the future is healthy. Uh, as we work as students and practitioners and teachers and researchers, and yes, also staff, um, how can we find healthy and respectful practices for ourselves, including healthy uh, sleep schedules, exercise, eating, respectful interaction, and how can we cultivate these practices for our collective? We've already made uh, steps towards all of the above categories. Um, we have far to go and lots of work to do as well. American writer and Cornell grad E.B. White once wrote, I arise in the morning torn between a desire to improve or save the world and a desire to enjoy or savor the world. I think we can do both, so let's do that. And I have a question before I go. I have a feeling that when we think about being, instead of being on the world, when we think about being in the world and with the world, this might have something to do with city and regional planning. So Sophie, why don't you share your thoughts on that? <laughs> Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mijin, um, Jin Yoon, um, for these really inspiring genealogies of, of AAP, of architecture, of art. Um, listening, I thought of a person whose work really inspires me, David Scott, who's a Caribbean anthropologist, and he says that one generation's um, vision aspiration for, in this case, post-coloniality, sovereignty, freedom, is the next generation's angst, disappointment, uh, struggle. And I think that's such a beautiful way of thinking about these stories and genealogies, the productive tensions when we think in these moments, in these practices, in this depth. So I am not going to add planning into this mix in this moment. I've been very beautifully included in this conversation. CRP has been included. Um, but I, I really want to just resonate that, uh, yes, these are the questions that shape our thinking about city and regional planning. The project of immersing ourselves in being in and with and acting in and reflecting on cities around the world, key questions for urban studies, for planning practice, for planning theory. And I think really um, in our field, 
we can frame them in such powerfully similar, similar ways. So really immersing ourselves in contexts in the global north, in the global south, in the intimate spaces of the home, in the broad spaces of state structures and global flows, of in infrastructure and climate questions. Um, we can think about these critically and we have to, and we are challenged to, to acknowledge the own limits of our expertise and to think in and with and to engage in collaboration with the myriad experts who inspire us and shape us and challenge us from ordinary citizens to activists, to politicians, to planners, to architects, to artists, to colleagues, um, and to really be immersed in and engage with that. This is a practice of thinking the present etched in, troubled by, mobilized by the past, but it's also a beautiful challenge, which in our field, parallelly, we are thinking both as a pragmatic question of seeing and doing and making visible and acting in and on, but also as propositional, as forward thinking, as future thinking. So I, I feel that bringing this back to an AAP conversation, that we have a real gift and a privilege of working together, of being in this work, in this collaborative way, that this to aspire to this vision is to bring it into being is really demanding work. And it's work that in, inspires us and demands that we hone our disciplinary skills, that we really do immerse ourselves in our fields, but that we have the imperative and the invitation and the push to be interdisciplinary, to combine our forces, to build conversations, to have a dialogue, to think together, to build synergies. So for me, that is a beautiful space that we have here together, a chance to build vocabularies, narratives, dialogues, to bring life worlds to view, to build in the crises of our day practices and an ethos, an ethic, a way that resonates in our commitments and helps us think forward. So for me, this is a beautiful vision, but it's also daily work. How do we do it together? How do we build together? How do we build with what we have at hand here? Um, at the end of the semester, we have a chance to think beyond the routine and rhythm of a classroom schedule or of all the sorts of meetings that we all attend. How do we hang on to that big picture? I'm thinking particularly like pizza has been a theme of this week, pizza across the, across the spaces of AAP. Can we share them? Can we bring them together? Can we do that in studios? Can we listen? Can we immerse ourselves in these amazing opportunities that we have at hand? So can we do that with care and with critique? For me, aspirationally, I think of this as a project of joy and rigor. So the joy, the humor, the passion actually that I've really heard in these three inputs and the rigor which we offer when we can be open, creative, critical and collaborative. So for me, this is what it feels like we have at hand in AAP, what we have an invitation to immerse ourselves in. So I wanna end this brief little few minutes by actually saying thank you. Saying thank you personally from myself, but also from city and regional planning. So as the newest kid on the block, so to speak, so I'm the newest chair and I'm one semester into being here. It's really a pleasure and a privilege and an inspiration to be here. And as the youngest department, uh, <laughs> formerly in departmental terms, very middle-aged. <laughs> CRP, are we going through a middle-aged midlife crisis? Um, but at 85, uh, you know, thank you for including us. Um, we are growing as a field. We are growing in AAP. And I think we have a joyful and rigorous chance to be stronger together. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie and Paul and Caroline uh, for your thoughts. Um, lots of incredible synergies. I'd like to open it up to the floor for any questions from our community uh, in the audience or by Zoom. Dinosaur barbecue will wait if you have any questions, but I will not hold you here if there are none. But um, really special opportunity, I think, to have Paul and Caroline and Sophie together. There's one. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for the wonderful um, conversations and uh, presentations that you all just gave. Uh, it was great to see all the departments together speaking about um, kind of their visions for the future. And I was wondering um, maybe what, uh, what tangible events or how do you envision the collaboration between the three departments going forward? Uh, as a student of architecture, we do kind of get caught up on the plate a little bit. So it's really great to be here with everyone. Um, yeah, what, what sort of tangible um, ways do you envision this collaboration happening? Thank you. Um, thank you for your question. I, I'll say uh, a few words, but I'll pass it on to Paul because I'm going to talk about Paul. Um, <laughs> um, I think uh, there, there have been really great collaborations in the past um, that have happened kind of organically between the departments where a faculty member in one department will, you know, run into another in the corridor and, and um, begin a class. And I think um, Paul will be teaching such a class with uh, Maria next year, so maybe you can tell us about that. But I think what's really exciting, um, maybe it's uh, just because we all started within the same year, but I think there, I think you can see it's clear that there, there are many overlaps, many synergies between the departments at the moment. It's a particular time in the world and not just in AAP. Um, and I think we are really interested in making more kind of um, uh, not not necessarily structural, but but more concrete um, possibilities for collaboration, and it's something that we'll um, work on this summer uh, in order to figure out, and then come back to talk to the students and the faculty about those ideas in the fall, about how we can really uh, embed that uh, so that it's not just a, a, um, a fact two faculty meeting in a hallway, but actually really kind of making a platform for that collaboration to be possible. Yeah, so so like like Sophie said, it's it's the daily work, right? So there have been collaborations in the past that are wonderful because the college is actually very agile about that. But Maria Pendas and I are planning a new course, but it's it's not just like oh one off. It's like this course has to kind of figure out the technocratic problems of credits and enrollment so they can run every year. We also have to solve pedagogical problems of like, if you want planners, architects, and artists in the same classroom, the class is very big. So, so we need to invent ways to handle like critiques for such large groups of people, right? So because we want it to be a production course, not just, it's easy to bring people together, say in a theory or lecture class, but we want to bring people together making things. So the idea is that we will work out this problem. We're already starting to recruit future faculty. So it's like, it's a class that just gets passed around and keeps growing over the years. So that's just one first step. And I think there's many others uh, coming down the pipe. Can I just add in two tiny little slivers? Um, I think we have a really fantastic opportunity with our cohort hires. So we've all hired. Um, so in the in the new academic year, we'll have with us um, some new faculty and they will be working together. So that's a whole layer that we didn't have before. And then I think we also have um, spaces on which we can build. So in Rome, for instance, and in New York, there's interesting bits of collaborative work and there are existing bits here as well. So really, I think a concerted energy and effort and um, with help from you guys as well, if that, you know, to, I think with student energy that also helps us move forward. Thanks. Um, this is for Caroline. Um, so your final slide uh, stopped on questions of being in and with the world. And I feel like um, those words start psychologizing our uh, participation in the environment. And, and like for my thesis, I, I, I basically asked the same question. And, and it turned out that I had to get in, in, into, like, into lots of cognitive science and a philosophy and, and, and stuff that it's very difficult to like get access to in this department. Um, and, and I'm wondering what possibilities you see for partaking architecture in into that space if, if you're serious about putting people about putting people back 
into the world as, as we see it? We have to wait two seconds for the microphone to work. So it gives us two seconds to think about the answers to our questions. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think it um, it brings up the question, not just of collaboration amongst us uh, and the, the three departments within this college, but the potential collaboration across the university. I mean, we're really fortunate to have these, you know, um, the, the, uh, the founder's motto, is abbreviated to any person, any study. So the idea is that you can, you know, you can study anything at Cornell and we have incredible departments that we can kind of tap into. I also think in architecture specifically within our faculty, we have some uh, really amazing experts who are interested in looking at issues of, uh, let's say sustainability, but not just alone, but working with uh, other faculty who are interested in uh, kind of social cultural issues and philosophy and psychology. Um, and I think what we'll be doing more of, and I think one of the one of the great um, lessons of the pandemic was that we can bring people in, uh, you know, who are not physically here. And so we had, I think, more visitors, virtual visitors in the department during the pandemic than we ever had before because it was so easy to uh, bring people in. So I think there, there are new models of studio developing where we're, we'll have more opportunities for experts to come in from the outside, from the rest of the university, and building on the, um, not just the faculty uh, experts that we have and their own internal collaborations, but their own networks as well. I think everyone on our faculty is really excited about that possibility as we hopefully emerge from the pandemic um, and potentially also traveling to other locations to engage with those people too. Okay, then I have to. Can you advance the slide for me, Andre? Awesome. Great. So um, I think we're birthdayed out, but <laughs> the birthday celebration will continue. Um, I wanted to update everyone on our fantastic lineup of anniversary events this June with alumni. Um, there will be an incredible exhibition called Centuries, Architecture and Art at Cornell University, 1871 to the Present, curated by Professor Sean Anderson. There'll be a conversation between alumnus Peter Eisenman and alumnus Shelley Silver on June 10th. And on June 11th, we'll have Ola Lake and Jay Foos speaking at the Olin Lecture in Bailey Hall. That's, usually, that's a university-wide lecture with usually about 1,000 people in attendance. So please consider joining us for these events. I'd also like to thank our incredible students for sharing their talents with us and thank our faculty and our emeritus faculty and our staff for their incredible commitment to our students, the departments and the college. I think we all owe each other a round of applause, but not yet. Um, <laughs> uh, one thing that was very unfortunate about uh, this period of the pandemic was that um, faculty who recently retired, we were not able to have a college event, but I'd like to recognize um, the faculty who retired uh, immediately before the pandemic and during the pandemic. Uh, George Haskup, Mary Woods, Kent Hubble, Werner Gerner, Henry Richardson, Jerry Wells, Jeremy Foster, Lenny Mirren, it's also the last semester for Jonathan Oshorn. In art, Barry Perlis, Greg Page, Stan Taft, Bill Gaskins, and in planning, Kieran Donaghy. And this semester will be the last semester for Dick Booth and John Forster. We welcome everyone as emeritus faculty as we move forward. And now I think we should give everyone a round of applause. Andre, can I have the next slide? 
So the moment you've all been waiting for, let's all go outside and enjoy the incredible sunshine with our all college barbecue. Thank you all. Thank <laughs> you.